know the book, and I'm sure many of you do, um, know that it's a, there's an early, early on in the work, in the very first book, a dismissal of what you could call the traditional sacred ritual uh, and so forth, when Socrates starts a conversation with uh, some young man, and there's an older man there, and Socrates is, um, if you read uh, carefully enough, you see Socrates is not very nice. Uh, he kind of stirs him up, makes him, uh, uh, calls into question, in, in some sense, his way of life, and, uh, and that gentleman says, okay, I'm leaving, <laughs> basically. Um, and he says, I'm leaving to go, I have to perform some sacrifices. And that's fine with Socrates because, uh, you know, now he has access to these, all these young men and a foreign sophist and they can really have a, you know, a, a whoop it up conversation, right, about uh, innovative things, which would have been difficult with the presence of that, um, the older gentleman there who in some sense represented that, tr the traditional or the ancestral. Um, so from that point on, you have a kind of movement in the Republic toward, um, as I, I try to suggest by this title, a rational city. And that begins with a, a kind of full-blown criticism of Homer and Hesiod, the poets of the Greeks, the standard uh, of, of learning, really, uh, for understanding what a good human being is, uh, the superior human being, Achilles, for example, um, being the kind of pinnacle of that. And, um, and that, once that criticism is carried out, it's carried out not by Socrates, but by a young, a young man who says, you know, um, if you look at this city, we're talking about justice, and he says we, uh, our teachings about justice are not very good, and they're not good because they, they're contradictory. And, um, and that forms the basis for the movement toward a rational account of justice, and following that, a rational politics that would, that would go together with that rational account of justice. Now this has far-reaching implications for theology, for how the gods are understood. Um, and if you look at the end of the second book of the Republic, you see there are some theological laws instituted. They're going to govern exactly what the poets can say about the gods and what they can't say. And those are very restrictive. I mean, the, the gods who could survive the, <laughs> the limits imposed by those laws, it's hard to say if they would be gods that would do anything. Um, and so uh, it, that institutes that, uh, a very strict kind of limit and, and the city then moves toward, um, I think, a society in which uh, that kind of a theology could be, could be this, the standard. Um, and and um, I'm, 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 I guess I'm trying to summarize a, what could be a very long argument into <laughs> a few short minutes, but um, uh, certain measures that are taken in the Republic later, for example, if you, if you know the book and and the most famous feature of it maybe is communism of uh, families, wives, children, and so forth. So a, a really communal type life. And, and one could go so far as to suggest, I think, that, um, that the theology and practices like that would go together. Um, that is um, the very rational, excuse me, the very rational theology that, that is the part of the Republic and those practices that are instituted or those uh, ways of thinking about marriage and family and so forth are, are you know, part of, a, part of a continuum, I guess, is one way to put it. Uh, and so um, it's a very radical work, and if you've read it, you know that, or if you, you know, you, you've uh, had done s uh, some thinking about it. Um, and uh, very, uh, obviously, a very interesting uh, work, um, but I, there's a, there's a puzzling aspect to the Republic, and this is in book four. This is a quotation from book four. They sort of go on, so from book two onward, they sort of go on talking like this, um, like, you know, everything's going to be great. We've got, uh, uh, and I, I, I apologize for being too, uh, uh, too, too uh, fl flippant or um, informal about it, but this is the way they, they seem to be going. Uh, the city's going to be formed. It's going to be... Uh, uh, have this rational theology and so forth. And then at a certain point, Socrates stops and says, um, this quotation begins after his interlocutor asks him, well, what's, what's left for us to do in our legislation? Do we need to do more to kind of get this city set up and going? And Socrates says, well, for us, there's nothing left to do. Um, however, you know, and he follows this quotation, for the Apollo at Delphi, they remain the greatest thing. So it's a very odd kind of statement. 
um, suddenly it's as though he's, they've gone on, you know, in this reasonable conversation, and he comes back and says, oh, well, by the way, um, we have to look back to the ancestral, to essentially to Revelation. And it's only there that we're going to get the most important institutions, right? Well, it, so this is a very puzzling uh, uh, passage in the Republic, and it, um, I, at least I've always been puzzled by it. And, I, and actually, when I used to teach classes on Plato here uh, s uh, several years ago when I was teaching here, I used to always raise it just to try to get answers to it because, and see what uh, students thought because it, it, al it always seemed to me out of place. Uh, but I think it, uh, my best, my best um, account of it is that it serves, Socrates sort of throws in a reminder, you know, maybe we're going too far and here's something to think about. <laughs> um, maybe there are things that human reason does not completely have control or jurisdiction over. So that, so much about the Republic and I, uh, we, um, we'll run out of time if I say more about it. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions because I always, I always learn more from uh, people asking questions than, than uh, you will probably from listening to me. So, but let me just go, go on and say a little bit about the laws. Um, it's a much less well-known work uh, if you've not uh, encountered it before, and s some of you probably have. I don't know, philosophy students here? Do we have any philosophy students? A few? Good, we got, we got one. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, the laws, you probably haven't read the laws or had a class on it, it doesn't come up very often. The Republic's much more uh, well-known and popular and, and more fun to read anyway, in a way that the laws is, is a discussion between old men. The Republic's a discussion between young people, you know, it's exciting. And, and the laws is, is just three old men talking. Um, so, uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's really imbued much more with the sense of the sacred. Um, than the Republic is. And in a way, it's, it's, it's Plato's, I think, his real statement on practical politics, what's possible. So to, to kind of summarize, I guess, my argument, uh, I think the Republic contains that reminder um, that you know, these things are maybe not totally within our control or we should not eliminate them. Um, we can't have a city without these things. And the laws really shows you how Plato thinks it should be set up. And so he has a... Um, a statement about that. He has several statements about it. It's a very long uh, work. I'll go to the end. I just put this in. This, is, this comes up in book five um, where the, uh, there's a chief interlocutor in the laws. He's called the Athenian stranger. He's kind of a stand-in for Socrates uh, or Plato, depending on whose argument you, you, you listen to, but, but, but maybe one and the same. Um, but he says this is what, you know, uh, when you're founding a city and you're a lawgiver, he said you you don't want to change these things. You, you listen to the ancestral customs and sort of move forward from there. Um, and so he, he accords this uh, very important place to, uh, to these, these things, um, whether they're ritual practices or uh, temples. And he even mentions um, in the laws, mystery rites. He has a kind of ambivalence about the mystery rites. I, I don't know a lot about these things, but the Orphic uh, mysteries and the, uh, if I say this right, the El Eleusinian mysteries about which there will be a paper um, see, uh, coming up soon in, in the next hour. Um, so he he says we don't uh, we don't know whether we have jurisdiction over those things or not. We're not. He's not even sure whether they're good for the polis, um, but. In any case, he, he's very much in favor of the, what you could call the standard uh, traditional things as opposed to the private mystery rights. I should say, too, that the private mystery rights co come under heavy condemnation in the Republic um, for being, you know, uh, sort of bad, uh, irresponsible teachings that make the gods look bad and so forth. Um, but in any case, so th this is the case in the laws. And um, you have the presence then of temples. and he, and he and uh, Plato says we'll we'll begin the city, and this uh, if we go back to that to the initial uh, historical slide that I tried to talk about with Burkert's work, where he says that temples go just go with the polis. Um, Plato wasn't really doing anything unusual in in founding the temples first. Um, if you started a colony, evidently, or or went to found a city, that's what you did. You laid you know you'd lay out the city, and you'd find you'd figure out where the temples were going to be first. Um, but in the laws, then, while you have this, um, 
it, it sort of moves in a very subtle way in the same direction as the Republic. Um, and you, you know, with any of these works, you have to read them and study them to see this. But it, it follows um, the same trajectory.